developing all those wonderful capacities talked about in those self-help books. And by the way, the self-help books, some of them are a little uh, way out there, but many of them are pretty reasonable. They're pretty good, actually. They are not lying to you. Some of it is anecdotal, but increasingly with the development of positive psychology. It's pretty rigorous academics also. Now, uh, when Dale Carnegie and others wrote, it was anecdotal, inspirational. But now it's a matter of academic uh, psychology. So it's not wrong. But why doesn't it work? Jonathan Haidt asked that question. Why, why doesn't it work? Why doesn't it change our lives? Why is it so difficult to change? He says it's, it's because what it does not address is the structure of the mind. Our mind has the structure. He uses a very beautiful Indian uh, analogy. He says it's like an um, elephant with a mahut. You understand what a mahut is? The one who sits on the top of the elephant and controls the elephant? So elephant with a mahut. The mahut is the intellect. And the intellect, the mahut knows where to go and can tell the elephant where to go. And uh, um, just like the intellect, it, it understands. But the problem with that is as long as the elephant obeys, it's fine. But if the elephant does not obey... The mouth wants to go this way and then there. But the elephant wants to go this way and then there. Then <laughs> there's nothing that the mouth can do to the elephant because the elephant is much, much stronger than the mouth. If the elephant wants to go there and raid a shop and eat the bananas there or <laughs> attack a um, banana plant or something and eat the bananas there, the mouth can't do anything because the elephant is much more stronger physically. It's just like that, our intellect which buys all those, we buy all those books from Barnes and Nobles and listen to TED Talks and then we decide, these are great ideas. I am going to revolutionize my life. I have taken the, what, Tony Robin, uh, Robbins seminar. <laughs> I don't know how many hundred dollars it is, several hundred dollars, I think. I am going to revolutionize my life. And by the way, I am not criticizing any of that. All of that is right. They are correct. They are not lying to you. But it doesn't work. Why? Because I am sold on it. But who's the I who loves these ideas, who's inspired by them, who's, who has this wow moment? It's the intellect. But underneath the intellect is the lower mind, the emotions and the, the uh, more than the emotions, the set patterns of a lifetime, of many lifetimes. And then there's the body, the physiology. I decide. I realize one of the keys to success and happiness in life is getting up early in the morning. I have to rise with the sun. Uh, monks in the Himalayas are very uh, clear about these things. They, say, they have sayings like, the one who does not greet the rising sun, knowledge of Brahman will not rise in his life. <laughs> you sleep. There are funny stories like, oh, I get up with the first ray of sunlight in my room. Oh, really? That's pretty good. Um, so when do you get up? 5 o'clock or 5.30? He, he says, uh, no, uh, my room faces the west. <laughs> Not that way. I'm, I'm determined to get up early in the morning. Early in the morning I get up, I, I have the alarm rings, I wake up. But then what happens? It's cold. It's so comfy under the blanket. And I want to get up. But then the body says, I didn't sign up for this. You, the intellect, you thought it was a great idea. Did you ask me? You go and get up and do your meditation and yoga. I'm going to sleep in, <laughs> inside the blanket. Can the intellect do anything by itself? No. It, it cannot force the body also. It gives in. And that's why... Every kind of practice which leads to difficulties, it comes from our lower nature, which has not signed up for that, which does not respond to, um, to knowledge and insights and lectures and seminars and books and philosophy. No. What does the elephant respond to? What does the mahut do for the elephant? It trains the elephant. The mouth doesn't persuade the elephant. The mouth doesn't give a TED talk to the elephant. The mouth doesn't sign up the elephant for a Tony Robbins seminar. No. It doesn't send it to HR programs. No. It trains the elephant. And training is mostly systematic repetition. The body-mind responds to repetition. So repetition, abhyasa, 
Somebody asked Sri Ramakrishna the same question. Uh, I, uh, my uh, mind doesn't settle down. Sri Ramakrishna seems startled. He said, Shiki, Abhash Jogkoro, what are you saying? Why don't you practice the yoga of Abhyasa? There's nothing more than the yoga of repetition. So, repetition, regular meditation, uh, is it will work. Over time, it is learned and it clearly changes the nature of the mind. You will see it becoming more uh, obedient, more subdued, more... Uh, it begins to flow. A new pattern is set. A time comes when it becomes natural. Sri Ramakrishna gives a beautiful example. He lived on the bank of the Ganges, the Ganga River. And you see these little boats plying. And you would see how the boatman would take a long bamboo pole and work hard at pushing the boat away from the bank into the midstream. But once it reaches the midstream and catches the current, he says the boatman would sit down, just hold on the rudder and would take out a, uh, you know, like a hubble bubble and smoke tobacco and merrily sail along on the current. But until it catches the current, he has to work hard to push the boat into it. So uh, the current of spiritual life means when it becomes natural to us. Uh, when, you, uh, when the mind is now set in the new pattern. Then you don't, you don't have to work so hard all the time. But initially, yes. That is abhyasa. It will work. But not by itself. Here is the another part of it. Vairagyena grihyate. The mind comes under control by vairagya. Vairagya means dispassion. And I must stress this. You see, it is um, a problem, a symptom of our secular, rather materialistic age, where here in the United States, for example, meditation is quite popular. But the dispassion side of it is never taught. The dispassion for worldliness, going beyond worldly desires. That is essential to meditation. That part is not emphasized at all. Perhaps it's not popular. Perhaps it's not palatable. All sorts of meditation techniques have been popularized. Mindfulness is very big now. But notice, whether it's mindfulness, vipassana, whether it's Tibetan Buddhist meditation techniques, whether it is yoga, kundalini yoga, uh, non-dualistic meditation, Whatever kind of meditation, if you look back upon the origins of all of them, they came from the high spiritual traditions, all of which emphasized a dispassion for worldliness, a detachment from the world. Not just Buddhism or Advaita Vedanta, every religion does that, if you're honest about it. Maybe not the modern versions of those religions, but if you go back to the original texts, absolutely. What teaches more dispassion? Then the New Testament, the Gospel of uh, Jesus, dispassion for the world. So, dispassion, it's called vairagyam. Uh, viraga, raga means likes and dislikes. Raga, dvesha, both are meant. Likes and dislikes, they color the mind. Any kind of strong pull towards the world, that is raga. I was amazed to read Freud, the wise old atheist, but he's pretty wise. Uh, I remember many years ago, it was nearly 20 years ago, in our teacher training college, teacher education college in India, in, in near our monastery, where school teachers were trained. So there was a department of psychology, educational psychology. And uh, we had pictures of uh, Freud and Jung and other, other well-known, uh, John Dewey, our American father of modern American education, uh, William James and others. So Freud has this little beard like this. Now, in that room, we had the annual Saraswati Puja, the worship of the Divine Mother Saraswati, a goddess of learning. So the image was there. And people from the locality would come and bow down to the image. So this little old lady comes to bow down to the image of Saraswati. And there are these pictures of the psychologists. She's standing before Freud like this. <laughs> and I went, and she asked me, I was walking past her. <laughs> I'll tell you in Bengali and translate. She said, Baba, e kon rishi? <laughs> My boy, who, I was a young a novice, he said, who, who, which rishi, which, which sage is this? She would have been shocked at what Freud taught, but, 
but it's true he is a rishi in a certain way the people who have insights in deep insights into human nature are rishis so he is insight when you talk about freud talking about libido we think of, uh, about uh, you know the baser passions of human nature but look at the definition of libido he says any movement of the subject to the object is libido any movement from here to outside anything outside is a manifestation of that same energy this is raga which will not allow you to remain centered it can start as a mild attraction something nice and pleasant it can develop into a desire i want it it can go into the level of an obsession and addiction it will not allow you to remain centered raga um swami ashokananda ji in a very nice essay he say about monks he says when are you ready to renounce the world when can you become a monk he says something interesting he says that if if you stay in the midst of the world and people and objects of the senses of things of the world your mind may be attracted disturbed by that but if you stay away from them in a monastery in an ashram in a retreat then your mind is at peace you don't hanker about it you don't think about those things at all then you are ready to be a monk if you stay away from the world and things and uh, you stay in an ashram and yet think about those things then you are not ready to be a monk it will you'll fail it won't work uh and those whose minds are steady and serene in the midst of the world and in an ashram they don't need any monasticism they are above it already there are very few there are but there are such people there are very few such people so you have to be in that middle category the same thing is true of meditation when can you meditate effectively it is when the raga the attractions the pulls of the world the things of the world don't continuously pull your mind outwards if you sit quietly in a meditation hall uh, in your little personal chapel or shrine in a holy place quietly sit there if your mind is more or less stable more or less it's may be restless but more or less then you can meditate but if you continuously pulled out you cannot there is raga the things of the world which pull us the obsessions the attractions the thing that this is nice i must have this and equally true the dvesha the repulsions it is a whole range just as raga is a range um, the different kinds of raga i want more and more money and property and that is greed i want pleasures of the senses from uh, eating good food to all kinds of sense pleasures that is kama uh-huh. there are various kinds of of raga attraction for the world dvesha repulsion for the world for people and things it can be a whole range it can be a minor irritation a minor dislike to a general dislike of a place a person a food uh, an activity a job all of these but general uh, a clear dislike i don't like this you might say what's wrong with that it is based on a false uh, notion of the world if it is true that it is the one divinity underlying everything you can see the good and the bad but underlying you must have serenity because ultimately it's a one divinity notice when you are watching a movie you root for the success of the hero you hate the villain and yet at the same time you're serene because you know there's no hero and villain there it's fiction it's an appearance of one reality couple of years back at uh, at harvard a student divinity student said i don't like your vedanta philosophy it tells me that mother teresa and adolf hitler are the same how can adolf hitler and mother teresa be the same i said it doesn't first of all it doesn't tell you that adolf hitler and mother teresa are the same it doesn't um, uh, it is much better to be a saint than to be a monster uh, but consider are they really all that different when they were little babies two or three years old was mother teresa mother teresa was adolf hitler adolf hitler no every night when they fall asleep deep sleep even the personalities are erased for the time being that being who's in deep sleep at that moment is this being evil and this this being good saintly no 
there is a layer in which goodness and badness are there the layer is the mind the personality if you take the mind and personality to be the ultimate reality then yes this is ultimately a saint that's ultimately a monster but no that's not the ultimate reality anything that has developed over time that is conditioned by causes and effects that is subject to change cannot be the ultimate reality neither saintliness nor um, what monsterliness a monstrosity <laughs> they are the <laughs> ultimate reality yeah. but yes at that level they are not the same you have to move from uh, adharma to dharma and beyond that from uh, evil to morality and ethics and rise to spirituality uh, so they are not equivalent but beyond that there is a the reality lies beyond all of these that's what advaita vedanta says so dvesha dvesha also disturbs the mind some people make a habit of enmity of dislike of others and holding on to anger and resentment you cannot meditate if it's like that and it's unwise i'm quite sure your indignation is justified i'm quite sure people have treated you badly but it is unwise to cultivate these fires when you set a fire you burn your own house before you burn somebody else you set a, what is uh, what is resentment what is anger it is here i am the person who is resentful of others who may have um uh, misbehaved with you you know mistreated you quite correct but first i make myself unhappy so that kind of mind cannot meditate raga and dvesha neither can meditate sri ramakrishna told the story of the boatmen who were rowing a boat the three not boatmen there are three friends who were drunkards at night they stumbled around and they wanted to go home across the river they found a boat jumped into it and started rowing as the day broke early morning they found they were still in the same place rowing hard all night long they rowed what happened that forgotten to untie the boat that forgetting to untie the boat that is raga and dvesh vairagya dispassion for the world is untying the boat is letting go doesn't ma- doesn't mean that you won't do your duties in the world you won't take care of people you will you will but your motto will be neither seek nor avoid seeking and avoiding comes from raga and dvesha attraction and repulsion neither seek nor avoid as far as the world is concerned why because there is some higher thing that you are about to do you are on the journey to enlightenment self realization god realization whatever you call it so vairagya is important complete dispassion for the world and its events at this point let me just uh, give some practical points you know so far i have said what krishna said meditation is possible if you have a regular program of repetition abhyasa and dispassion for the world untie your boat don't be like those drunkards untie your boat um but um oh before that just one more point you know when they say that uh, all this giving up the world sitting quietly meditating it's repression and it can lead to mental instability huh. it does sometimes why does it why does that happen it's because vairagya is not there w- when does it lead to um mental problems that f- firmly cutting away the world sitting quietly and meditating trying to meditate for long hours it's only when there is a strong outward movement and i'm denying that and i'm shutting it down and trying to hold it down within myself then it leads to a reaction in the mind my tendency is to want things and chase after things and to achieve things in the world i'm stopping myself from doing that in the name of spirituality and that leads to a revolt in the mind krishna has already said that in the gita he says mithyachara sauchyate the one who sits withdrawing from action sitting quietly in a meditative posture closing the eyes shutting out the contact with the world and thinking of the world in the mind that one he says mithyachara sauchyate that one is called a hypocrite then what is the way out if i am then don't give so much emphasis on meditation do your regular meditation but engage in karma yoga i'll tell you what is to be done practically to purify the mind one monk in uttarakhand put said n- nicely he said 
समाधि तो आसान है महात्मा जी शर्त है कि आप चित्त शुद्ध होना चाहिए आपको एक मिनट में समाधि लगा देंगे वट डज इट मीन समाधि द हाइस्ट स्टेट ऑफ मेडिटेटिव एब्जॉर्बन इज इज वेरी ईजी महात्मा जी ओ मंक आई एल गिव यू समाधि इन वन मिनट हाउ इज द कंडीशन इज योर माइंड मस्ट बी प्योरिफाइड प्योरिफाइड ऑफ राग एंड द्वेश दिस कंटिन्यूस एम्ब्रॉयलमेंट इन द वर्ल्ड द मेंटल लेवल और राइट नाउ सम प्रैक्टिकल एडवाइस दिस आई हैव टेकन फ्रॉम स्वामी अशोकानंद जी very beautiful before you sit in meditation i have mentioned it at other times but i'll quickly run through this uh, practical advice for good meditation what do you do one you do it regularly you see abhyas repetition again do it regularly not when the mood seizes you not when you feel very spiritual not when you are on a meditation retreat only do it every day second have a fixed time so sometime in the early morning sometime in the evening or night if you are too busy some do it three times a day uh, early morning afternoon and night so fix time the mind is a creature of habit remember the elephant the elephant is a creature of habit not of intellect it responds to training it responds to rhythm so time have a fixed place that's why we have meditation halls and temples and churches and um, you know um, shrines and chapels uh, that's because that's why we have a particular seat for meditation an asana that's why we have even in india you say you have a special set of clothes which you wear before meditation your one set a clean same kind of clothes but a clean separate cl- set set aside for meditation why all of that helps the mind again a creature of habit and repetition it immediately tells the mind this is the time you when you must be calm and turn inwards uh, when you must follow the mantra follow the breath visualize the deity whatever your technique so these are these things will work for any technique of meditation in any tradition fixed time fixed place mm-hmm. which the mind immediately associates with uh, meditation you see half your work is done there do not dwell on thoughts which are disturbing i cannot emphasize this enough do not dwell on what you might call bad thoughts it could be thoughts of um, you know which old thoughts of guilt anger resentment negativity um, sensuousness um anxieties all kinds of negativities the mind has a habit of dwelling on these things try not to do that replace it immediately there is a very good thing a way of handling the mind is a secret of the mind is it can dwell on only one thing at a time you might think it's a very what's important about this it's a very important thing to know in order to handle the mind is if the mind can handle only one thing at a time it does so very quickly that's why we think the mind is doing many things it does very quickly one thing at a time in that case if you want to handle the mind very effectively immediately try this give it something practical to do it's e- even good if you do it something physical you know get up clean the room do a chore something go for a walk yeah. so if you do that the mind will stop it it has to be engaged yeah. listen to a song or go and meet somebody in conversation so that you can't mind cannot run elsewhere it, it can do only one thing at a time so do not dwell on thoughts which are negative Uh, the whole range of negative thoughts negative company bad company there are people and places uh, which arouse um, likes this raga and dvesha obsessions and hatreds of the uh, which are worldly in nature so don't uh, mix with them uh, some sri ramakrishna would say that a little plant that you have a seedling that you have planted on the road side it needs to be protected by a little fence otherwise he said the goats and cows in india in the roads you'll see goats and cows walking around so they'll come and eat it up so you need to fence it once it grows and becomes a huge big tree he says you can tie an elephant to it we having a lot of elephants in today's talk he says you can tie an elephant to it nothing will happen but initially you must fence it around so bad company be be uh, clear about whose company you want to ke- keep it has an effect on our mind then um the next thing is to practice 
some amount of asceticism. By that, I don't mean become a monk. A simple life. Few positions, few activities. As I said, neither seek nor avoid. Few activities, few positions. A minimalistic life. Um, positions, for example. The more we have cluttered room, cluttered positions, in lifetimes accumulation of things, our mind is on those things also. Normally we don't realize it. You sit for meditation, you'll realize. Half of your mind is scattered in things. Um, so an ascetic lifestyle. And then, the next thing Swami Ashokanji says is, have this sense of vastness. This entire, you see, the immensity of space, vast mountains and um, oceans, lands beyond the horizon, and beyond that the universe, so vast, and yet it is all appearing to you and playing around in you, the consciousness. You are vaster than space itself. Eternity, the vast periods of time, millions of years, billions of years. Think about one lifetime, 80, 90 years, seems to be very long. It's like gone in a twinkling of, a, of an eye. In our own experience, if you are um, 20 years old or like Bill, you are 97 years old, as I'm sure if you ask him, if it's just for a moment, he can recall his whole life you know, in general in a twinkle of an, um, in an instant. It has passed. 97 years have passed. As 97 years is a twinkle to you, twinkling um, in an instant to you, the consciousness, so is a million years, so is a billion years. You are vaster than the eternities of time, vaster than the immensities of space. Have this feeling within you. What Vedanta is telling me, that is my real nature. I am vast, not this limited creature only. This will give stability to the mind. Have a yearning for enlightenment. Here, devotion or bhakti is very useful. The yearning for limitless existence, consciousness, bliss is a bit dry, philosophical. But yearning, that can happen. Some natures have that. And yearning for freedom, spiritual freedom. But yearning for a personal God is easy to cultivate. My Rama, my Krishna, my Jesus, you know, my Rama Krishna. That love. So have a yearning. Yearning also stabilizes the mind. Just as thinking of things in the world outside can pull our mind outside. Similarly, thinking of God and loving God can pull the mind towards God. So yearning is very important for uh, meditation, good meditation. The next, the activities in the world, let us spiritualize it as much as possible. The job, the family, the chores in the house, my own personal affairs like health and everything can be offered as a worship of God. Not just the flowers which we put in the shrine, the incense, but also our daily activities can be offered. As we spiritualize our daily activities, a little bit of ritualism can be useful here. It elevates, you know, if you do a puja, mindfully a short puja, it actually spiritualizes the mind. It develops the quality known as sattva. I have run out of time, but I must say this. I mentioned Jonathan Haidt, his book Happiness Hypothesis. One reason I remember it was, he did this experiment, do rituals work, religious rituals. Do they actually do anything to the mind? And he mentions it. He says that he went to Orissa, Bhuvaneshwar, which is on the eastern coast of India. And I like that very much because that's where I grew up. <laughs> so he says he went there. And he went to the, there are very ancient temples there. I mean, temple older than a thousand years of the commonality there in, in, that, in that town, in that city. It's in fact known as the city of temples. So the famous temples of Lingaraj, which is the temple of Shiva, um, there are sacred pools of water outside, Bindu Sagar. Uh, so the priests in the temple, before they go in for worshipping the deities, they take a dip in those pools and they recite mantras and they come out. Now what he did was, he conducted the psychological tests, like a, a questionnaire, a battery of questions. He gave those tests to the priests before the rituals, and after they performed the rituals, general questions about life and person, personality and all of that. 
And he says there was a significant difference. The, after the rituals, the thought patterns changed, at least for a while. And the feelings about themselves, the world and others. So clearly those rituals have an immediate effect on the mind. may not last very long, but if you do it repeatedly throughout your lifetime, then they have an effect and they elevate the mind. So a little bit of ritualism, whatever your tradition uh, allows you, whatever you do in it, don't do too much. Ritualism is like weeds, tends to overcome and cover metaphysics and meditation and uh, devotion. All of it is becomes, especially for the Hindu mind, we are very ritualistic. So it tends to overgrow everything else. The garden just becomes a garden of uh, rituals, of weeds. Um, so rituals, a little bit of rituals, very helpful. And finally, holy company. And the company of people who are meditators, who are genuinely devotional, spiritual, uh, their company. What did I say? Let me run through it quickly. I hope I remember the list. Ten things. Ashokanji has mentioned. So I've summarized a long essay in these 10 points. One, meditate regularly. Two, have a fixed time. Three, have a fixed place. Um, four, avoid bad thoughts. Five, avoid bad company. Six, um, practice a little bit of asceticism. Seven, cultivate vastness, infinity, eternity. Uh, eight, yearning for God. Not desire for the world, yearning for God. Nine, spiritualize daily activities, a little bit of ritualism also. And ten, seek holy company. Good. I'm patting myself on the back. <laughs> <laughs> I remembered all ten. <laughs> the thing is to do them. With this kind of a preparation, meditation becomes deep. So this um, section is very beautiful, where Arjuna being ever being the practical warrior, he's a kshatriya, the warrior, and uh, he has a very practical question. All these wonderful philosophies, belief in God, devotion, non-dualism, all those are wonderful. But they all depend on the mind. How do I make the mind amenable to all of that? Do all of that? And Krishna answers, practice, repetition, vairagya, dispassion for the world. Abhyasa, vairagya. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Raparnamastu